Well, again, good afternoon, and just quickly going through our announcements as a reminder, if you're a visitor, we have a gift book in the back there, What is the Gospel? It is free, and we wish for everyone to have a copy. Um, I don't believe we're going to be doing a fellowship meal after this service, um, but normally we have one, so in, in those occasions, everyone is wanted and welcome. And we're going to skip down to the doctrines of the faith. This is from the New City Catechism. I will read the question, and then together, let's read the answer. So the question is, how can we be saved? And together, the answer is, only by faith in Jesus Christ and in his substitutionary atoning death on the cross. So even though we are guilty of having disobeyed God and are still inclined to all evil, nevertheless, God without any merit of our own, but only by pure grace, imputes to us the perfect righteousness of Christ when we repent and believe in him. And one of the proof texts for this doctrinal truth is from Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. We're going to be passing by communion today. We had some supply issues with that. So I'm going to jump right to the reading of Scripture. And today's text is going to be largely from Ephesians chapter 2. So I invite you to open your Bibles with me to Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Paul writes to the church in Ephesus. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him. And seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in the kindness towards us in Jesus Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let us pray before we begin. Heavenly Father, we ask that your word will be precious to us, that we would receive it with faith, that we would walk in obedience to what your spirit moves us to do. May we be a people prepared for every good work, though not relying on our works, not trusting in our works to make us right right with you, but to remember that we only do good works because you have already made us right by the work of Jesus Christ. So may we offer our obedience to you out of gratitude, out of the result of receiving a new nature, out of being a people with new understanding. May we show that we are your people by what we do as changed and transformed people. 
I'm going to pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So we wanted to start with an analogy of what the church is doing today in its ministry and how we as a church in America have no longer come to trust in the power of the gospel and its sufficiency. And so I thought I was trying to think through an analogy of what that is like and what we are doing. Imagine that you are the owner of an apple orchard, and you have acres and acres with rows and rows of apple trees, and none of them are bearing fruit. And you think to yourself, well, these days here in Arizona are hot. Perhaps the sun is keeping them from bearing fruit. Perhaps the sun is what is drying up these trees and keeping them from bearing fruit. Despite all my watering, despite all my efforts, they have failed bear fruit year after year. And so I spend millions of dollars to cover my orchard with this large facility, shielding all of these trees from the sun, because after all, it's the only thing I can think of that is keeping them from bearing fruit. They just need more shelter, more security, more safety. And so I I give them a safe place to grow, and I continue to water them, and yet these trees fail to bear fruit. One day I get fed up after all the money that I've spent. All my investment is not returning with all these efforts. And so I bring in an expert, and he looks at my trees, and he says, My friend, your trees are all dead. Now, you would think that that's a silly thing to do because if a tree is dead, obviously it's not going to bear fruit. Israel, would you be able to turn this off? Yeah. Obviously, dead trees don't bear fruit, but the thing that we do as a church is we look at people in America and we cry out for them to bear fruit in their life. We demand that they bear fruit. And then we, we, we look at things and we go, well, maybe the hard circumstances of their lives are what keeping them from doing what is good. So we'll just hand out money. We'll give them safety and security. And then they'll do what is right. Because after all, isn't the only reason why these people aren't bearing good fruit the fact that they don't have safety and security? And then I give them safety and security. And they cease to... They, 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 they never, ever bear good fruit. They continue in the way that they were. They continue acting like dead people, spiritually dead people. You know, if your primary problem is that you are dead, it doesn't matter how much sheltering, how much safety that you offer. You cannot do what a living tree does. A living tree takes the sun and the pressures of life and bears fruit. And I think of this, in parenting, I would give this analogy. Suppose you had a cute little puppy and you found it with chubby little cheeks and these big fuzzy paws and adorable floppy ears, and it only has one problem. It's dead. That's the only problem it has. And you think, well... I've heard that vultures are a threat to dead puppies. So you take this dead puppy and you put it in the Tupperware container and you shelter it and you keep it from the threats of the world. It starts to smell a little, so you add another Tupperware container that contains the other Tupperware container and you wait 18 years. And then what you do is after 18 years, you open up the container and you set the dog free. And all you find inside is a bunch of dead bones. And people parent like that. They look at their children and they, they don't understand how to raise their children. They don't understand how to see children in the way God sees children. Children are born spiritually dead. Children are born without a nature capable of bearing fruit. There's no child that has to be taught how to do it automatically. 
But we tend to think that if we give them safety and shelter and keep them from the troubles of the world, by the time they're 18 and we set them free, they're going to produce good fruit because we've given them safety. We've given them all these provisions, and yet they go off into the world after all these protections we've poured into them, and they do not bear good fruit because their primary problem is that spiritually dead. Spiritual death is mankind's primary problem. We see this in politics today, too, where Marxists will say, well, the reason why those people have to do bad things is because other people have more stuff than they have. And so if there is not this disparity in their life, if we take from those who have and we give to those who have not, those who have not will no longer continue to do all these horrific crimes that they do. They have to commit these crimes because other people have more stuff. And so instead of looking at the criminals and saying, you know, their primary problem is that they, from within, from within their own hearts, they have a spiritually dead heart. Instead, we say the problem is outside of them. And if we can just fix the problems in the world, they're going to be better people. And, and the church is accepting this. We're, we're bringing into the church this idea That if we just get rid of the tension between different races, if we get rid of wealth disparity, if we, whatever it is, if we just give them that, they'll be good people. We're buying into this and we're beginning to preach another gospel. Man's primary problem is that he is spiritually dead and hostile to God by nature, by his simple relationship to Adam. Spiritual death is our primary problem, not circumstances. Circumstances matter. It's not like they don't matter. Circumstances matter. But circumstances aren't what cause our sin. You know, Jesus was born poor, and he was oppressed. But he didn't sin. But why didn't he sin? Because Jesus lacked one thing that we have. He lacked the sinful nature. And so if it's simple, it, as simple as circumstances produce evil in people, then Jesus would have been a sinner too. But Jesus was poor, and Jesus was oppressed, and yet without sin. Notice how the Bible describes our state before Jesus Christ. This is our text, Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, verse 1 here. It says, And you... We're dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Now, how many of us were once dead in our sins? And Paul answers that question in verse 3. He says, among whom we all once lived. We all once lived in the passions of of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. What does it mean to be in the flesh? We were all living in the passions of our flesh. What is flesh? Paul says in Romans 8, he says that the person of, who is walking according to the flesh is hostile to God. But then Paul tells us in in verse 9 of Romans 8, he says, But you are not in the flesh, if indeed the Spirit of God is in you. Which means to be in the flesh is to not have the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. So if you're in the flesh, it means you have not yet received the Holy Spirit. So if you have the Spirit, you're not in the flesh. If you're in the flesh, you have not received the Holy Spirit. Now, how do we receive the Holy Spirit? And Ephesians 1.13 tells us that when we believed the gospel, we were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. So when you hear the gospel, you receive the Holy Spirit, 
and you're no longer in the flesh. And if you're no longer in the flesh, you're no longer hostile to God. So when Paul says, we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. We all once walked without the Holy Spirit. We all once had desires of the flesh that governed our behavior. They were the desires of our natural self, the desires of our body and our mind before Christ. We were by nature worthy of wrath. Simply born worthy of wrath. Now notice what spiritual death looks like. Spiritual death looks like living in sinful passions, having sinful desires. You know, why do we choose between the good and the evil? Because we either have good desires or evil desires. We don't just choose arbitrarily. We don't just choose things randomly. We choose according to our nature. And our nature determines what we desire. And if we are hostile to God, then we choose those things that oppose God's law. Until we are born again and receive a new nature and receive new desires, until that point, we are enslaved to our passions, carrying out our sinful desires and doing what deserves God's wrath. And we're acting like everyone else. Notice that where he says, like the rest of mankind. And that last part should terrify us. Because how many times do we justify our behavior because everyone else is doing that? Everyone else is doing this. God, don't judge me. Everyone else is, was doing this. And God says, I know. That's why I condemn you. Because you are just like all the other sons of Adam. So we have all lived a life exactly like everyone else. We were all dead in our sins before Christ. And that's our primary problem. Death is our primary problem until we come to Jesus Christ. And so until we believe in the gospel, until that we're dead in our sins, but when we believe in the gospel, we receive a new nature we receive the Holy Spirit, and we receive all the benefits of the Holy Spirit through the gospel. No other way brings us into that life of understanding and empowerment and equipping and understanding. Maybe I said understanding already. But that all comes from faith in the gospel first. So death was our primary problem, but notice that God first deals with our deadness before he does anything else with us, he first deals with our deadness. And we see that in verse 4. But God being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Pause there. How does God make us alive? He makes us alive by the work of Jesus Christ. He makes us alive when we receive by faith the work of Jesus Christ. He makes us alive by a gracious gift that he gives to us. We do nothing to receive it other than we simply receive it by faith. And he makes us alive. He does this as a gift. The reason why we don't start with good works, the reason why we aren't first called by God to do good works before he receives us is we cannot do good works. Romans 8, 7 through 8. The person whose mind is set on the flesh is hostile to God. He cannot please God. He cannot obey the law of God. Then Paul says, but you're not in the flesh if indeed the Spirit of God is in you. If indeed the Spirit of God is in you, then you're not in the flesh. But if you're in the flesh, you cannot do good works to please God, which is why we can't start with good works to be pleasing to God. The remarkable message of the gospel is that he first makes us right with him before we can even do what is right. 
He first makes us right before we can do what is right. God clears our record. God changes our nature. He gives us new desires. He gives us new power by his spirit as a gift. And then as a result of our being made right with him, then we begin to do what is right. We don't obey in order to stay right with God. We don't obey in order to become right with God. We obey because he has already made us right. So God makes us alive before we can do good works. That's why Paul wrote, even when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. There was no works involved when he made us alive with Christ. We were not capable of doing good works to be made alive by Christ. So if you remember our dead fruit trees, their primary problem is that they are dead. And if we have a way to make them alive, then they will bear good fruit. Many times we, you know, we look at people who are like dead trees and we, we think if we just encourage them, give them a pep talk from church today, they're going to begin to bear fruit. Or maybe if we just are legalistic and we restrict things so that they can't bear bad fruit, at least we've stopped the bad fruit, we've sheltered them, we watched over them like some cults do, they're not doing anything wrong, and therefore we consider them to be righteous because we've kept them from expressing their inner sinfulness. But that, I would propose to you, is like taking a dead tree and duct taping fruit on it. The tree's primary problem is that it is patient and believed in him you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So the gospel is preached first. The gospel must always be preached first before we believe and receive the Holy Spirit. Paul says in Romans 10, faith comes by hearing. How are they to believe unless they hear? And how are they to hear unless someone is sent? So faith comes by the preaching of the gospel. And when the gospel is preached, people believe. And when people believe, they receive the Holy Spirit. And they receive a new nature. And they receive new understanding. And they receive equipping for ministry in the church. So the gospel must first be preached before men come to life. So Ephesians 1 establishes that the gospel must first be preached. But now here in in verses 6 through 9, it says, And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. No, I did not see the gospel mentioned there, but it's implied because it says, by grace you have been saved through faith. And the question we need to ask is faith in what? Well, Paul has opened his book with the very words that we put our faith in the gospel when it was preached. So implied here is faith in the gospel. Faith in Christ through the gospel. By grace you have been saved through faith in the gospel. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Notice that bearing fruit does not come before salvation. Bearing fruit does not come before hearing the gospel and having faith in it. Bearing fruit comes after we've heard the gospel. Bearing fruit comes after we've received the Holy Spirit. Because after all, it's called not the fruit of us, but the fruit of the Spirit. We must be made alive through the gospel you know, I have a lot of these debates with various people of, uh, because I've done a lot of work in politics and I deal with a lot of people online who want to debate politics. 
especially Christians. Christians are like, we need people to have strict laws. We need people to, we need for this country to turn around. We need to, we need strong leaders who will stand up and make good laws. I say, all right, how do we get those good men and good women out into politics? How, where do we find them? We find them in the church. We find them where the gospel is preached. And if we send people into government who have no true faith, we should not be surprised when they shrink back and when they don't pass good laws and when they don't fight injustice. Because, Romans 8, they are hostile to God themselves. Been in many Republican rallies, and you think, oh, they're all Republicans like me. You know, they're going to be good people. You'd be amazed how many godless people there are who are elected officials who do not know God. And so we need more true believers, but we can't have true believers unless we're preaching the gospel. Winning back America comes only by the church doing its work in preaching the gospel and no other way. So in Ephesians here, everything from verse 1 through 9 is about God making us alive. And God is addressing our primary problem of being dead in our sins. And it is only after God makes us alive in Christ that Paul says this in verse 10. He says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let me just make two quick comments here. One, you are saved in order to do good works. You are saved in order to do good works, which means, second point, that calling people to obey is not legalism. But if you call on people to obey before you've taught them the gospel, then it's legalism. Because you have not given them the message that changes who they are, that gives them the Holy Spirit, so that they can even obey to begin with. Calling people to obey without the gospel, without faith in the gospel first, is legalism. And not only that, it's futility. Because why? Romans 8. The man who walks according to the flesh is hostile to God. He cannot please God. He cannot do it. We must first be his workmanship before we can produce good works. For we are his workmanship, not our own, created in Christ Jesus. Notice this. God has done a work in us, created something in us through Jesus for good works. Good works is the result of that. But these are good works. Truly, we are called the good works, though. And so we need to avoid the error that after we bring brought people into the church that we hover only at the gospel and we never begin to disciple them in obedience. But we don't disciple people who don't believe because people who don't believe are hostile to the very instruction we're about to give them for life. Also, we don't instruct people to obey in order to stay right with God. We remind them, you have been made right with God. You have been given all that you need for good works. Now go and do it. Walk in obedience. It won't be perfect, but grow. Grow in obedience. Walk in obedience. So God did a work in us before we begin to do good works. We do not do good works and then have spiritual life. Because death is what prevented us from doing good works. We must be born again. We must be made alive. We can only be made alive through the gospel being proclaimed. So in, in the ministry of the church, there is always an order that must be observed. 
First, the gospel, which calls men to an awareness of their sins, calls them to have a change of heart about their sins and to turn away from sin and to turn to God in faith through Jesus Christ. That's step one. Then they receive a new nature. Then they receive the Holy Spirit. Then they receive new desires. Then they receive new understanding and receive equipping for life. And then we tell these people here who God has made them into his workmanship, we tell them now go and do good works. You have been made right with God. So that is the order. We must always remember this order. We must always begin with the gospel. Always begin with the gospel. Remind people of the gospel because once people begin walking in obedience and they see that they're not yet perfect, they begin to strive in their works in order to be right with God and they forget that's not what good works is for. And they forget the gospel and its sufficiency and they forget to rest in it. Let me just remind you that if you've come to faith in Jesus, you have received the righteousness of Jesus Christ as a gift. That's how God judges you, is having received the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. And God is perfectly pleased with the righteousness of his son. Why? Because his son is God too. Jesus is God in the flesh. His righteousness is the righteousness of God. Which is why scripture says we have received the righteousness of God as a gift. God's own righteousness is how God sees you. He sees you as having his perfect righteousness. And so we don't need to strive in order to make God approve of us more than he already does. He's already perfectly pleased in us because of our faith in the gospel. So our primary problem is that we are dead trees and cannot bear fruit. So dead trees only come to life through the gospel. Let me just quickly wrap up. Without the gospel, we do not have the Spirit. Without the Spirit, we do not belong to Christ, Romans 8, 9. Without the gospel, we are hostile to God, Romans 8, 8. Without the gospel, we are ignorant of spiritual things, as 1 Corinthians 2. Without the gospel, we don't have the Spirit who gives us spiritual gifts and equipping for ministry, 1 Corinthians 12. Without the gospel, we do not have the Spirit by whom we bear good fruit, Galatians 5. Notice everything flows through the gospel of Jesus Christ. All of Christian life comes by the power of the gospel. And it's sufficiency to give us all these things. So here's, here's my point. The work of church, the church is gospel proclamation. That's our primary work. The primary work of the church is gospel proclamation. Why? We preach the gospel before men will believe. We preach the gospel before men can come to life. We preach the gospel before they can belong to Christ. We preach the gospel because Men cannot do what is right on their own until they have been made right. We preach the gospel so that they can be moved in what is right. We preach the gospel so we remove the hostility within them. We preach the gospel so that they understand and are equipped for ministry. We preach the gospel so that men can bear good fruit. We preach the gospel so that we have good politicians in America. We preach the gospel so we can have godly parents. And we preach the gospel before America can ever turn back to God. And so we cannot make America great again unless we make the gospel great again in the church. And so we've got to remember this. The primary problem of America is that people are dead men walking unable to bear fruit, and what they desperately need is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that's why we must be a gospel-centered church if we are to be faithful in our mission as a church.
And so let's close in a word of prayer after that. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have made us right with you through your Son, through the drawing of your Spirit, and that you have caused us to be born again. That you have caused us to be made alive. We thank you, Lord, for your understanding. And I pray, Lord, that we would be an understanding people. We thank you, Lord, that you've gifted us for ministry. So, Lord, may we be faithful in ministering. Lord, may we love those in the world who are lost. And may we be faithful in bringing to them the gospel. Give us boldness. May we not be afraid of the threats of the world that hates your word. Because we were once dead in our trespasses too. So may we bring to the world what we so desperately needed ourselves. May we never forget from where we came. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And let's close with our one last song. Thank you.